John Richard Klein talking to you from the Sony TCM 5000 EV cassette tape recorder. This particular cassette tape recorder came out in the year 1984 and was manufactured from 1984 all the way to 1992. This particular unit is a professional grade type of recorder which would have been very expensive when new and was made for use by reporters, interviewers, investigators, and other similar professional voice recording application type use. Their frequency response is 90 hertz to 9 kilohertz and the unit runs at the standard speed of 1 and 7 eighths inches per second. This particular recording is being made with the built-in microphone using automatic level control as is for a typical shoebox cassette tape recorder but this unit also has a voice activation mode and manual level control as well. You can also hook up not one but two different microphones and adjust the level of microphone number two although the level of mic two is in series with the main level so controlling the main level will control both sensitivities together while mic two can also be adjusted by itself to compensate if one were to speak extra loud or something like that. Now I have an external microphone plugged into the unit running it with automatic level control. I'm speaking about four inches away from the microphone. Now I'm speaking at arm's length distance from the microphone and it still picks up my voice well. It has a good ALC operating extremely nicely with the meter. In manual level control mode I can adjust the recording level so I can make sure that I do not make a recording that goes into the red zone of the VU meter. A good setting for close range speech is at 3. With the levels not all the way up it's quite sensitive to sound and is overdriving on the meter as I speak at arm's length distance. Now the unit is operating in voice activation mode. For some reason when you're in voice activation mode the frequency response is narrowed down to 300 Hertz to 5 kilohertz probably because they probably figured that if people were going to be using the voice activation mode they would probably be using it to record telephone calls and therefore wanted to narrow down the frequency response probably to keep out excess noise perhaps things like 60 hertz homes from telephone pickup coils and you know maybe another maybe some high frequency interference noise if that ever got into things and to keep it more at around the telephone voice uh, frequency response Also, no surprise is that on voice activation, you also have um, uh, automatic level control only. Well, apparently you can adjust the sensitivity of the voice activation, but I can't seem to get the best range of sensitivities out of the voice activation sensitivity setting. But it could just be operator error. Oh yes, okay, yeah. I mean, yeah. My, 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 yeah. My favorite, of course, is manual mode. I enjoy using manual mode when I'm making recordings. For curious parties out there, the microphone I'm using is an Electro Voice Model 635A. was
was a manual mode level all the way up recording of a chirping device nearby outside. Another nice feature is that this unit also, when you use two microphones, is excellent for recording two-way conversation where each person can have their own microphone. But keep in mind it is a monophonic recorder and both channels or both microphones are mixed to one mono channel. In dual microphone mode if you were to use a mic microphone number two with nothing plugged in to the mic one jack you will mix the built-in microphone with microphone 2. If you were to plug in a microphone 1 into the mic 1 jack, then you're using both of the external microphones. If you were to use the microphone 2 input with a line level input, you will mix the line level and the microphone 2, but the internal microphone will be cut off. That is a basic overview on the recording. More will be described in person in the video and not from the tape recording. This proves to be a pretty nice cassette tape recorder. So now I'll describe a little bit more of the features. So this unit, you may have noticed, is a three-head cassette tape recorder. Now, the three head is for the express purpose of monitoring the tape during recording so that the person recording can know without a shout of a doubt that a successful recording is being performed. Now, this differs from your typical three head cassette recorder as I will show. Notice the tape transport. You'll see right here is the erase head. And right here, typically on three head cassette recorders, like the Marantz ones, for example, the this will actually be two small heads kind of butted up together. But on here you'll see it's actually one head. This is a record playback head. But I thought it was a three head recorder. How come it's a record playback head and not a separate record and playback head? Here's why. Here is a tiny little head. That tiny head inserts through this hole on the cassette tape. Obviously it's not going to make as good kind of a um, tape to head contact as this head does. So this head is merely for monitoring the tape during record mode so that you can be sure it's recording. It has, doesn't have as high quality sound as the regular record playback head does. It's just for basic monitoring. So that's how this three head machine is implemented. It's very interesting that the head is so small. Actually the base of the head is a little bit bigger as you can see and then it has a small part jettisoning, jettisoning out so that I can go into the cassette tape. Also notice there is no motion. How come there's no motion? I have it in play mode. Well, it has detection of motion. If it senses that this is not turning for a length of time, it will de-energize the motor. When loading the cassette tape, the cassette is placed into the bottom first and the door is closed over the cassette. If you want to pre prevent someone from accidentally ejecting the tape, you can engage the lock mechanism which will keep the eject button from being pressed down. If you disengage the lock then you can eject the cassette. You can notice on the front of the recorder is a small tape counter. And then here is the controls for monitoring source and tape. If you monitor source and you're in playback mode, it will still monitor the tape. This is only for use with record mode. Automatic manual and voice activation mode can be selected here. 
and then here is your main volume control. This is a record and playback master volume. This is the sensitivity of microphone number two. If you adjust your sensitivity of microphone two to some level, adjusting this main control, which also adjusts microphone one sensitivity, will adjust both mic one and two sensitivities together. You may have noticed earlier that the level meter, when you push this button, you can check your batteries. It will also light up a light on the meter, although it's not the brightest light in the world. If you're making a recording, excuse me, you'll notice that it's monitoring the tape. You'll notice some delay. Right now I have it manual with it all the way up. I just want to illustrate the delay. If I'm monitoring the source, you'll see that the level is in real time with my voice. But, once I monitor the tape, you'll notice a delay in meter deflection because it's coming from the tape recording itself. If I go into voice activation mode, for the duration of motor operation, the VOR light will be on. Notice that once the motor had de-energized, the light went off, and once it started speaking, it came back on again as it continued recording. What is it? I don't know what's with this stopping. This is the only problem I'm having with this machine. It doesn't like review. It does that. I don't know why. If I'm monitoring the source, you'll see that the level is in real time with my voice. Tape recording gets on. Notice that once the motor had de-energized, the light went off. And once now, this machine I did have to replace the main drive belt, and I also replaced another small belt that I think goes for some of the automatic stopping system. I had to use a thin diameter belt. Now, the inside of this machine, the I don't have any footage of it, unfortunately, but you can find pictures of the inside of these online. It's a 90 degree angle motor in reference to the rest of the drive mechanisms. The belt actually has to twist or turn 90 degrees in its path. I have found that belts that are thinner have less flutter issues with 90 degree motored drives than thicker belts. I tried replacing it with, now the original belt was thin, but it was, of course it was too loose. I replaced it with a, another belt that was a little bit tighter, because I didn't have one perfectly the right size right away, and it was a little thicker, your typical belt thickness. And then I did a flutter test and guess what? Yeah, even though it's a dual flywheel machine, professional grade, there was freaking flutter. I wasn't very happy about that. Then I opened up a cassette recorder I had lying around. This more modern Optimus machine. Hoping to get lucky. And alas, I pulled out a belt out of that Optimus recorder, which was the right thinner diameter as the original and exactly the right size, not too tight, not too loose. It fit perfectly. I was thrilled. Then I did another flutter test and guess what? The flutter was gone. So thinner diameter belts, I also say this from work with the Sony TC55 cassette recorder, I was trying to put a better belt inside the machine to see if I could make there be less flutter and only ended up being much, much more flutter as I had a thicker diameter belt that had to make a twist on its 90 degree drive. When earlier I had a thinner belt in there and that thinner belt had considerably less flutter. I'm ultimately going to put that thinner belt back in the machine because even if you order brand new belts for the TC55 Believe me, you're going to have flutter because the original belt in it was actually like a Mobius strip and finding 
And now it was a square belt, but the belt was twisted in its actual formation so that it would stay evenly put on the drive. It's, I hope you can understand what I'm trying to say here. Because a 90 degree drive, not of this recorder, but of the Sony TC55, if you're not familiar with that model, it's this little one here. It has a 90 degree drive as well. The motor is on its side in reference to the rest of the uh, drive mechanism or, the, or the, the wheels, the flywheels and so forth. The belt inside this, the original belt, or at least inside the Sony Secutive recorder which is uh, the Sony Secutive BM10 or something like that, almost identical to this recorder in mechanics, had a Mobius strip type square belt in it. I can't find Mobius strip belts anywhere online because I'm afraid probably the knowledge of their existence is far and few between. Because I think most people they just assume it's a regular belt but I started looking at the original belt from the Sony Secutive and I noticed, oh, wait a second, it's actually a Mobius strip. It's actually turned over on itself. And that's why the original ones wouldn't have flutter problems, but of course that original belt was too loose. And the replacement belt that I ordered for the Sony TC55 was um, thicker than the, well it was probably, it was the same thickness as the original would have been. But it was not a Mobius strip, so I had lots of flutter. Not just a little flutter, lots of flutter. But when I had earlier had originally replaced the belt of the Sony TC55 in 2009 when I first got it, the belt I put in happened to be a thin diameter belt. It wasn't Mobius at all, of course, but it was a thin belt. It was a square belt, but it was thinner. Therefore, it, even though it had a slight amount of flutter, it had less flutter than the thicker belt. And then on this recorder, this one think, thankfully did not need a Mobius belt, nor was its original belt a Mobius belt. But still the same rule applied as far as thick and thin belts are concerned. If you have a 90 degree drive, a thinner belt will have less flutter than a thicker belt, in my experience, at least with two different tape recorders. So just my two cents on that. That was a very prolonged time wasting ramble. I will also demonstrate on this recorder the use of two different mics. I will also play back conversational audio recorded with this microphone notice how my voice cut off when I said microphone because I was intending to say the word recorder but instead the word microphone mistakenly came out of my mouth instead of deciding to edit it out I decided to keep it in there for two particular reasons. Reason A, kicks. Reason B, giggles. Yes. Hello, this is Mike 2. I don't want to voice activation mode. Hello, this is Mike 2. You can see, the, you can't see the bloody meter. You still can't see the bloody meter. Okay, now you can see the bloody meter. I'm in just automatic mode right now, but um, I'm speaking through microphone number two. You notice that I can adjust the sensitivity of microphone number. Oh, oh, it's picking up to the other mic. That's why. It's misleading. Notice I have this being used like a dongle. It's cutting off the built-in mic. Now 
you can see clearly that I can adjust mic 2 sensitivity but of course because it's an automatic level control it doesn't take much until it's fully going manual mode will illustrate it a lot better so I move my level all the way down you notice the meter doesn't deflect and then you'll notice I can adjust my sensitivity here in manual mode Jesus thing is since oh it must be because I have it both together okay yeah manual see I can adjust the main sensitivity um, with the main control here but I can also adjust the sensitivity of mic 2 with this outer control uh, you see how that is but I cannot make this like uh, I cannot make this sensitivity exceed this basically like uh, this is the master right here so anyway so that's that now I have two microphones actually you notice it's considerably less sensitive that's weird the dongle was actually making it more sensitive that was weird I didn't realize that would happen I haven't tried it with this thing being used as a dongle before that is bizarre. Hello, hello. Wow. Hello, hello. This is speaking through mic one. This is speaking through mic two. You can see it's less sensitive. I have to move this up now. Hello, hello, hello. Speaking through mic one. Speaking through mic two. Speaking through mic two. Speaking through mic one. Speaking through both mics together. But anyway, yeah. I apologize for my long winded, horrible explanations it's just it's I don't know what to say I don't know what to say you know I might do a short series on this later this video is a full-length type video I might later do a short series it's more concise and quick paced where I don't have these long-winded talks but in this video I'm going long-winded I've already broke the long-winded rule whenever I or broke into the long-winded rule, let's put it that way, whenever I started talking about the Sony TZ55 belts. And that was just, that was atrocious. That was, that was too much. The following is a recording of two-way conversation between me and my friend Michael Green. Both microphones being used were Electro Voice 635As. But I have bad news. The recording has buzzing interference noise because this homemade cord to hook up an XLR to this jack here uh, isn't the best when it comes to shielding and so forth and it picked up interference noise unfortunately. So that's from that cord not the recorder or the microphone. And that's of course only one of the microphones was doing that, the other one was nice and shielded. But anyway, this will illustrate the use of two microphones to record two-way conversation where each person has their own microphone. One of the people himself being named Mike. So, talk about your, uh, your feeling on the Universal Remote and the television set. I don't really like it. Hmm. It used to be small, old, and it took forever to program that stupid remote. Mm -hmm. The weird. television set here is made, is made by the Symphonic Company, model WS-1901, and it was manufactured in the year 2001. So it's about, it's 18 years old TV. How'd you know about, that? It had the manufacturing date on the back, 2001. Uh, wow, yeah, that's pretty old. <laughs> it's got to give a good picture, though. Yes. Picture's just fine. <laughs> it was funny. When they came in, they told me, you have, they told me I had cable. I don't have cable. That's just antenna TV. Oh, that's sad. There's like 10, 10 channels. Oh, that's so sad. You have cable. You have and they have it hooked up like cable. With oh, that's funny. So they think it's cable. Yeah. Wow. 
I guess that works as a really awesome antenna, though. They probably the whole have, building is an antenna. They, yeah, they, I bet they have a really big antenna. It's probably amplified, and then they have the converter, of course, and it's, they have it fed yeah, to all the TVs to all throughout the, the building. All the outlets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite something, eh? That gives you a really good picture, though. Yeah. Joe's got a, a flat panel in his room, uh -huh. and there he, I gave him my mom's old antenna, mm -hmm. but it was, it's a... It's all pixelated. Yeah, the pictures are, are kind of sketchy and uh, fuzzy and stuff, and, but uh, even though the, the, the antenna cost like 30, it was a $35 one, mm -hmm. which that's kind of a lot for an antenna, I guess. Yeah. And it has the, uh, it doesn't have just a clicker on top. It has like a magnifier. It's, it turns real smooth. Mm -hmm. And the further up you, it goes, I guess, the more more gain. amplification, the yeah. more gain you have. So, it worked really good on my suit. No, it didn't either. I take that back. <laughs> it wasn't that great. Hey, have you seen the commercials for those? Antennas that are supposed to be just super freaking awesome, and it's like a little square, and you can like mount it on your window, and then connect it to the coaxial on the back of the TV. Um, it sounds vaguely familiar, but I haven't seen. I don't think I've really seen much of the commercials. I haven't been really watching TV much in a long time because of they're, commercials. They're supposed to be really awesome, and you know, pick up all the channels that are possibly can pick, be picked up. You know, the over air mm -hmm. channel channel. Anyway, that is an example of conversational recording. This is a very good recorder for conversations and interviews. One more tidbit I want to mention before I show musical playback. Actually, two tidbits. Tidbit A. I found an alignment tape that had a zero VU recorded reference. You may have noticed earlier that when I adjust playback volume, it also adjusts the meter deflection. I'm not the biggest fan of that kind of feature on a recorder. I like it when a meter is fixed in its deflection so that it shows the true status of the recorded le level on the tape. So, using that reference tape, I found that if I set the volume control to right at about four and a half, then the deflection on the meter will reflect the actual recorded level on the cassette tape itself. The other tidbit I want to mention is this PEA light. When you get towards the end of the cassette during a recording, obviously the optical motion sensor, or actually it might not, it's not optical actually, I think it's a magnetic motion sensor in there, a Hall effect or whatever, it detects a faster rate of on-off, on-off, on-off as the tape on the supply reel is turning faster and from that it determines once it reaches a certain rate that it, de it determines the cassette tape is coming towards pretty close to the end of the tape once it sees that it's coming close to the end of the cassette it gives you a warning by, by blinking the PEA light during recording and it stands for peak end not peak, what am I thinking? pre end alarm. Also, if you are recording and monitoring through headphones, it will make a beeping noise every time it lights up to alert you that it's close to the end. The beeping noise is not recorded onto the tape, however. It's just for, listen, for people monitoring recordings to be audibly aware that they are getting close to the end of the tape. It's just like, beep, beep, beep. Beep. Now, I will show how this machine records music. Again, I apologize for my long-winded explanations and long-winded talks on things. I mean, see my Mechanical Pencils 5, for example. That video spans over four hours. The following song is called The Last Tune by Robert Lawrence, 
one of my favorite musicians, my most favorite musician of all time. And it comes from his cassette tape 27 from the year 1985. About around the time this machine would have been made. Anyway, that was a presentation on the Sony TCM 5000 EV Japanese made Sony or cassette tape recorder. I just wish that uh, I don't know why I said to go on, but anyway. I tried rubbing it some weird marking that got on there, and then the rubbing of it did that. Uh, anyway, runs on 4C batteries. Okay, I guess I think that concludes my long-winded video on this Sony cassette tape recorder. Planning on using this recorder soon and later today to record some random notes and possibly a, me a talk about mechanical pencils by Evan Rogers and myself. That's what I'm hoping to, one of the things to get on this machine. Oh, I've got to be careful though. I, I shan't use this cord. Otherwise I will, or at least most likely will, very likely will pick up noise. Oh,